In the theme of this video, we should start out by first clarifying a few concepts. It is very important where you decide to put your attention because wherever you put your attention imparts importance to that object, concept, or thing, whatever it might be. Could be the government, it could be a corporation pretending to be a government, it could be money, it could be a school system, it could be a telephone could be many different things and there are so many mechanisms to call to attention different objects or subjects a phone notification is a simple example of that wherever you direct your attention is wherever you will go it's what can sometimes be referred to as voting with your feet and it seems that today most are focused on a path that was leading to our destruction because that's where the attention is going towards destruction and wherever you put your attention provides leverage to whatever entity is gaining that attention and hence with the basic concept of marketing is attention control what gains and holds attention and where is it being put of course, we can always reverse the process by putting our attention somewhere more beneficial. And that's basically, in concept, the only way to fix the position of attention. And this gets into what the idea of quality. Now, there are many things that go into quality, but the main component that imparts quality to something is through trade. What has trade value? What is tradable? The quality has to do with that now. Today, unfortunately, most of the trade is governed by so-called big box stores and big names, and they set the trend or they set the example, which is then followed by others, such as with local markets, where the price set of of produce for instance can be found at big box stores and then that is followed by the local markets meaning that the attention given to the supermarkets and big box stores means they have the power and ability to trend set and set the price market price of products now this system is definitely due for a upheaval and that upheaval can come in many forms but the basic idea is that it is stagnant and a very bad system. And if you travel overseas, you will find that you might be charged based off of your accent and skin color because that is the system that has been set up and it is an old system that we've seen before. Now, the way that this will, or the way that the upheaval might take a form is through innovation and specifically those with the abilities ability to defend themselves from the corrupt as those people fight to keep their power now this system is easiest to describe in terms of banking now when it comes to the governments and system economic systems of today it is very simple. You start out with the Vatican, which is the only true government that exists. All the th entities that we call governments are really just corporations and they're subsidiaries of the United Nations, which is in itself a corporation. Those governments or banks print bank notes. They do not mint coinage. They make bank notes. The coinage is minted under the Vatican which we can also refer to as the Roman Empire, render unto Caesar, and all that. It has to do with coinage. Who mints the coin? The governments aren't really governments. They're actually banks. They print, they print banknotes, and they deal in banking. That is the system, anyway. The only true government in the world 
is the Vatican, which is very obvious when you even look at their flag and coat of arms. Gold and silver keys crossed. As in, like, two guards crossing their spears to entrance. Now, in the Constitution of the United States, it stipulates what a true government under the Constitution is charged with doing, specifically the Congress, and that would be to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with Indian tribes. But the important part is where it states that uh, Congress shall have the power to coin money. Mind you, not print money. Coin money. Regulate the value thereof and of foreign coin and fix the standard of weights and measures. Now, they certainly don't do either of that because the corporation pretend, pretended to be government that we have today is actually a bank and they don't do any of these things because they're not a legitimate government and they are not empowered to do what the true government is empowered to do because only the Vatican can do that today and naturally whoever regulates the coinage regulates the value of currency of the banknotes because this is the simple way that you can find it is that the government mints the coin and that forms the basis of the banknotes that are then published by private banks and that's how it works so all banknotes today are actually backed via the minted coinage of the vatican and this concept can be further addressed in the levantine adventure the travels and missions of chevalier d'arvu 1653 to 1697 by warren h lewis and this book is a first edition. It is the first American edition and was published originally in 1962, but this one was published in 1963. All right, it's reserved and all that. <clears throat> now, on page, on chapter one, page 11, it states. Insurance and freight must have been heavy for Postillon carried a valuable cargo merchandise worth 25,000 livres and 25,000 livres in cash to say nothing of the passengers money and the trade goods of the officers and crew cash and bullion of course still travel about the world but not under the conditions which in the earlier part of the 17th century made them the chief French export to the Levant. For some reason, perhaps because business over the Asian trade routes was still largely conducted by barter, the Ottoman Empire minted remarkably little coin. Notice that word, minted. But the barter system could not be used between Frank and Turk because French exports to Turkey were insufficient to pay for their imports from the Levant. And the trade could be balanced only by the French exporting cash to pay for their purchases. This state of affairs did not embarrass the French exporter of cash, for the sale of his return cargoes to Western markets more than recouped him for the cash exported. But it was a constant worry to Colbert and his successors, who held that their process was draining away the wealth of France. Already the export of cash had been prohibited, but to conduct the Levant trade on any other basis in the then infant stage of French manufacturers proved impossible. And the wholesale evasion of the edict was winked at. It was not until 1682 when French factories were turning out export goods in large quantities that a new edict making it illegal to export more than a third of a ship's lading in cash was strictly enforced. No doubt much of Postillon's cash consisted of five sold pieces a penny, whose manufacture expressly for export to Levant was a profitable sideline for the French mint. For in the general dearth of the of cash the turk was glad to buy them for seven and a half souls but unfortunately this traffic had a boomerang effect coiners manufactured and exported base five soul bits many of which found their way back to marseille where by 1666 the quantity of bad money in circulation was a serious nuisance ultimately the sultan instituted a new customs branch staffed by expert money trier triers which dealt solely with imported cash, and after this, the amount of base money circulation rapidly diminished. And of course, what they're talking about is the minting by a legitimate government of legitimate coinage, which we have very little of that today. Now, on a different page, 33, 
we get a look at the idea and concept of weights and measures. It states, the Turk, normally so corrupt in matters of administration, controlled his food markets and especially his bakeries in a startlingly different manner. Darvu records that on one occasion, the Constantinople chief of police making a surprise inspection of the baker's quarter caught one of them selling bread underweight and instantly ordered the culprit to be baked alive in his own oven, a sentence which was carried out on the spot. An ambassador who heard of the, heard of the incident observed to the Kaimakan, as this officer was called, that the punishment had perhaps been a trifle severe and received an answer which makes a contribution to the tiresome controversy over punishment which rages today. I entirely agree, he said, but by the timely aid of this severe punishment, we shall prevent others from offending for a much longer period, through their fear of being similarly treated, whereas you Franks have to keep on punishing because your sentences are not severe enough to deter your criminals from sinning again. That's an interesting note and an interesting perspective, and it's no surprise why the sentiment in the Ottoman Empire was one of fatalism, but we find that fatalist mentality in nearly every part of the globe today, considering the amount of corruption that is done by banks that parade themselves as government. Now, looking further into this concept, it would be well worthwhile to look at companies that mine metals and the movement of the metals that these companies mine and the real reason why no governments today mint coin but print banknotes and how can you mint coin if you don't have any metals to do so and when all of the metals are being mined and sent somewhere else it's no surprise how the system operates and the first company we're going to look at is the Rio Tinto Corporation which is a uh, which is headquartered and registered in the United Kingdom it is not a Spanish company it is a English company specifically and I wonder where it goes the uh, metals go after they arrive in England if that is in fact how it works and of course this company was established in 1873 a very interesting date and they focus on iron ore bauxite alumina aluminium copper molybdenum gold diamonds and others like silver but of course those are done by subsidiary companies and according to the wikipedia profile it states Rio Tinto Group is an Anglo-Australian multinational company that is the world's second largest metals and mining corporation behind BHP. The company was founded in 1873 when a group of investors purchased a mine complex in the Rio Tinto in Huelva, Huelva, Spain, from the Spanish government. It has grown through a long series of mergers and acquisitions. Notice they bought it from the Spanish government. Why would the Spanish government sell its mint to a corporation? Unless that government changed from being a legitimate government into a bank. Although primarily focused on extraction of minerals, Rio Tinto also has significant operations in refining, particularly the refining of bauxite and iron ore. Rio Tinto has joint head offices in London, Global and PLC, and Melbourne Limited, Australia. Now, as far as their subsidiaries go, the company has operations on six continents but is mainly concentrated in Australia. Canada and owns its well owns is a certainly shaky word there but owns its mining operations through a complex web of wholly and partially owned subsidiaries and that's no surprise that is just how the corrupt scheme usually operates the perception of competition when in fact all things are owned by the same parents and those parents are then in turn owned by a single entity in energy resources of Australia, it retains a 68.4%, but the three companies that are important to look at or that I thought felt to look at are Hathor Exploration, an interesting name, Kit Fair et Titan, and Turquoise Hill Resources. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. When it comes to the first one that we'll look at, Kit Fair et Titan, 
uh, it states, Keep Fair et Titan, QIT, from its old name, Quebec Iron and Titanium, is a Canadian mining company located in Quebec. The company operates an ilumite titanium oxide ore mine at Lake Teo in northern Quebec, and southern Quebec operates refining facilities that produce titanium dioxide, pig iron, and steel, and other metal products. The company is a wholly owned subsidiary of mining giant Rio Tinto Group. So, therefore, it's not, in fact, a Canadian mining company. It's actually a mining company of Great Britain, because that's where Rio Tinto Group is located. QIT operates a 26-mile, 42-kilometer railway line, the Chemin de Fer de la Rivière Romain, from its Lac Allard mine to the port of Ave Saint Pierre, uh, the St. Lawrence River. The line carries mined ore as well as passengers, trains for workers, and serves as the only access route to the mine. Now, Turquoise Hill Resources is a Canadian mineral exploration and development company headquartered in Montreal, Quebec, a majority owned subsidiary of Rio Tinto Group. So, therefore, it is not, in fact, a Canadian mineral exploration and development company, blah, blah, blah. It is a UK based one. Its principal and only material mining resource interest is a 66% share of the Oyu Tol Tolgoi copper gold mine in southern Mongolia, 200 kilometers east of Dalanzagad. Zadgad, it's a difficult name to say. The company was called Ivanhoe Mines until August 2nd, 2012, when a financing agreement was completed with Rio Tinto. And this is a typical example of the bait and switch, name changing, and shell companies that uh, all of these corrupt entities deal in. Now, the Oyu Tolgoi project is considered one of the world's largest copper and gold porphyry deposits. For development to happen, Oyu Tolgoi, an agreement had to be made in which the Mongolian government took 34% stake in the project. Now that's because that Mongolian government is in fact a bank. It's not a government, it's a bank. That's the stake that it has in it, and it all seems to go back to the same place anyway, so what a joke. The royalty arrangement it currently has with the Mongolian government took years to reach, which caused significant delays in project development. In Australia, Turquoise Hill Resources has stakes in mines containing gold, uranium, copper, and the world's highest grade molybdenum and frenium. In Mongolia, the company controls several other gold and copper mine development projects. It owns a 50% interest in the Kaizal Gold Project in Kazakhstan through Altinalmas Gold and has exploration projects in China, Indonesia, and Philippines. Turquoise Hill Resources also owns 14% of Entry Gold, a company with interest in copper and gold projects in southern Mongolia and Arizona, and 14% of Exco Resources, which operates Klon Curry's copper project in the White Dam Gold Mine in Australia. So this, these people specifically deal in gold, but it always goes back to the same parent, so go figure. The company's largest stakeholder is Rio Tinto, with a stake of 50.8%. This is up from 46.5% beforehand. Blah, blah, blah. The company's largest shareholder is... Re yeah, that's, I read that. Um, in June 2011, Rio Tinto paid $502 million for $55 million additional shares, increasing its control to 46.5% from 42%, 35% prior to that, and giving it an extra seat on the board up to 7 and 14. 7 slash 14. Though Rio Tinto is restricted from its increasing its stake in the company to a majority before 2012, since 2006, Rio Tinto invested $3.5 billion in Ivanhoe Mines. I don't think invested is the right word for that, but former Canadian Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, <laughs> it's an interesting last name there, it's like Cretan, is a special advisor to the company. Yeah, okay. Former Canadian Prime Minister, special advisor to the company. Yeah, I've seen that one before that little trick. In September 2010, it was reported that exploration around Oyu Tolgoi, Tolgoi at the Aruga North Deposit revealed higher reserves of gold and copper than previously estimated. The news caused IVN share prices to rise 6%. The capital spending is likely to reach $5 billion. In October 2010, Ivanhoe announced a new $1 billion share offering in order to raise funds to develop this mine. 
due to new entitlement offers by Ivanhoe Australia made to raise funding in order to develop assets in North Queensland, Australia. Ivanhoe Mines' interest in the company was reduced from 81% to 61%. And all this information is basically meaningless because all of these companies are controlled by the same entity, and that's the usual story. And it is only a facade of competition that we see today in nearly every industry. That's the Keynesian dream, anyway. In 2016, Turquoise Hill produced a 201,300 tons of copper and 300,000 ounces of gold, exceeding guidance and generating US $0.12 billion in revenue. The company recorded net income from continued operations attributable to owners of Turquoise Hill of $210.6 million. They also work in coal, but for this purpose we are looking at precious metals and how it might relate to coinage of legitimate government bullion and cash. At least as far as the Vatican goes. Now naturally, many would might say, oh well these companies are located in UK ultimately, but that's a very common funneling point and the UK government itself issues banknotes not coinage in continuation with this example the mines acquired in 2003 are located at Mount Issa Cloncurry with the largest project being the Merlin mine which has the world's highest grade Moldenum Rhenium deposit. The other is Tennant Creek. It has also acquired the Barrick Gold Osburn asset near Merlin, which has an ore processing plant. Completion of the purchase required 18 million. Copper and gold, Oyu Tolgoi has measured and indicated reserves of at least 36.3 billion pounds of copper and 20.2 million ounces of gold. Newly discovered deposits at Oyu Tolgoi could add substantially to the measured and indicated reserve estimates. Oyu Tolgoi, the world's largest gold, third largest copper and gold mine, still requires 4.6 billion investment before, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, investment, sure, that's what that is. And in Mugglehead Magazine Mining, Mag and Fresnillo connect Mexico silver mine to national power grid and ramp up production. Commissioning of the jointly owned Juanicipio project has formally started and full nameplate capacity is expected in Q2 with uh, second quarter 2023. And of course, I bet you can guess where Mag and Fresnillo ultimately are located. And you would in fact guess right. And of course, this article was written by... Rowan Dunn, published December 30th, 2022. That would be last year. According to this article, Vancouver-based Mag Silver Core and Mexico's Fresnillo PLC, that's PLC's uh, UK, have had the necessary testing completed by Mexican electrical authorities to connect their silver mine to the national power grid. Yeah, Mexican electrical authorities, more like Mexican electrical employees for the Mexican electrical subsidiary of the Mexican bank government. In continuation, the companies announced news of the milestone on Wednesday and say the entire system at the site is now energized. The commission of the project has formally started. Mag and Fresnillo say once the commission is concluded or will be processed at the site. Yeah, of course, naturally. The news follows Fresnillo installing substation equipment at the site on behalf of both companies. On behalf of both companies, please. They're the same company. They're just subsidiaries of the same parent anyway. Um, which is compatible with older infrastructure from the National Power Company production. There will now be slowly ramped up with the intention of reaching full nameplate capacity by April 2023. And the Juanicipio project contains high-grade silver along with gold, lead, and zinc. Max says the site is only 5% explored and a strong financial position. Connection to the power grid is a long-awaited milestone for the Juan Escipio project, our stakeholders and stakeholders alike, and we are thankful for the understanding and patience as the final steps to connect the plant to the national power grid were concluded, says George Paspalas, President and CEO of Max Silver. We now turn to working with Fresnillo to maximize value generation from Juan Escipio as we head into ramp-up 
full-scale operations with Hana Sepio graduated to Tier 1 silver producing. And of course, naturally, they are playing the pretend uh, competition and um, working together angle, not that they uh, get their orders from the same entity and therefore are not independent nor separate. They are simply two faces of the same coin. Irony intended. Mag Silver has a 44% stake at Monticipio, and Fresnio has the other 66% share, and of course that entire percentage goes to the same entity as we've mentioned. Fresnio says Monticipio is its next major growth project, and that from next year onward the site will be a major influence in its operations. The company also says it expects an annual silver production rate of 11.7 MOZ and a gold production rate of 42.5 KOZ per annum over the course of its mine's life. Max Silver stock decreased by 2.23% today to 21.08 on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Fresno stock increased by 1.74% today to uh, that's um, 8.42 pounds, and the London Stock Exchange. Notice the symbol for pounds is the same symbol used for the leave, which is very interesting. And now we get into Hathor. Hathor Exploration Limited is a uranium exploration company based in Vancouver, British Columbia. Its exploration office is located in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. Hathor's exploration projects concentrate on properties within the Athabasca Basin of northern Saskatchewan, Canada. It is focused in uranium, formed in 1996 in Alberta. And, of course, the parent company is... Rio Tinto. In, der, in the Wikipedia article under Rough Rider Deposit and Discovery, the most significant assets attra- attributed to Hathor Exploration is its Midwestern Northeast project and the Rough Rider Deposit's multiple zones of uranium mineralization. The Rough Rider Deposit's wet zone was discovered, West Zone was discovered in February 2008 with drill hole and uh, this is a bunch of different um, technical information, which you can read if you so desire. Next, we will look at Fresneo Mining Company, PLC, located, of course, in London, formed in 2008, and naturally uh, one of the major miners of silver, go figure, in Mexico. It states, quote, the company operates three gold and silver mines in Mexico, induced three S- Peñoles retained the right to its primary base metal mines within Fresnillo when Fresnillo was spun off. The largest mine in terms of silver output is Mina Proano, also known as Fresnillo Mine, located near the city of Fresnillo in the state of Zacatecas. The other mines are at Cienega in Durango, Durango and Eradora in Sonora. In 2007, Fresnillo PLC produced 34.3 million ounces of silver and uh, 279,614 ounces of gold from its three active mines as well as 20 tons each of zinc and lead as byproducts. The company has 21 active exploration projects located across the country. It signaled plans to use money raised in its IPO to expand into Peru and Chile. What a surprise there. Simply more taking of the resources of conquered areas. And another interesting company is Great Panther Mining, which, surprise, surprise, is located in Canada, Vancouver specifically, operates gold mine in Brazil, and uh, also has interest in Mexico. And it was founded in 1965. And, of course, naturally, it doesn't stop there, because it states that in addition to exploration properties in Mexico and Canada, and its ownership of the Cori Concha Mine Complex on care and maintenance since 2003 in Peru. Great Panther owned and operated three operating mines. The Tucano Mine in Amapa, Brazil is an open pit mining gold door bars or dore bars. It was acquired by Great Panther with its 2019 merger with Biadale Resources Limited. The Topia Mine, of course, in Durango, Mexico and uh, Guanajuato in Mexico. 
And when we look further into that, it states the Guanajuato mine complex near the city of Guanajuato, Mexico, includes the Guanajuato and the San Ignacio mines centralized cotter processing plant. While it has been subject to mining activities since the 1930s, it was acquired by Great Panther in 2005 and further developed as an underground mine to produce silver and gold concentrate material. It was sold in 2022 to Guanajuato Silver Company, LTD. Very interesting indeed. I wonder where Guanajuato Silver Company LTD is located. I would second put a guess as probably England. And interestingly enough, there is a physical Rio Tinto location, a river, which uh, presents the image of the River of Blood that was alluded to in the Bible. And in this article by Lorenzo Chioti, uh, published November 3rd, 2021, it states Rio Tinto, how pollution has produced an incredible mutation. The chemical nature of Rio Tinto is the result of extreme, extreme mineral pollution with heavy metals including gold, silver, and copper present in the water in significant proportions. In continuation, it states, Rio Tinto is a river in southwestern Spain which originates in the Sierra Morena Mountains in Andalusia. It follows a south-slash-southwestern course reaching the Gulf of Cadiz near the city of Huelva. Tinto stands out for its hike acidity of its waters, pH 2.2, and a deep reddish hue caused by dissolved iron. Of course, remember that the Rio Tinto group bought the mines originally in 1873 from, you guessed it, Huelva, Spain. And in continuation, it states acidity leads to serious environmental problems due to heavy metal concentrations of the river. Visitors are drawn here to see its eye-catching colors, but who, those who think about swimming in the vibrant waters should think again that's not a surprise there that would definitely not be a fun time and it also it states the chemical nature of rio tinto is the result of extreme mineral pollution with heavy metals including gold silver and copper present in the water in significant proportions the result is a harsh environment that is not conducive to life rio tinto area has been the source of approximately 5,000 years of ore mining including copper silver gold and other minerals extracted as far as 20 kilometers from the river shores. River's shores. And it states, a possible result of the mining, the Rio Tinto is notable for being, for being very acidic, pH 2, and its deep reddish hue is due to iron dissolved in the water. Of course, one of the main components of blood is, in fact, iron. So go figure. Acid mine drainage from the mines leads to severe environmental problems because the acidity low pH dissolves heavy metals into the water. It is not clear how much acid drainage has come from natural processes and how much has come from mining. There are severe environmental concerns over the pollution in the river. There is not much to ex experience here, and those who do venture put their health at risk. Dangerous bacteria thrives in these conditions, and while the river can be pleasant to watch, bathing should be strictly avoided. Sounds exactly like what was done to the river in Egypt in the Bible area era. And it also states, this article, Several hundred years ago on the banks of the river, veins of gold, silver, copper, and etc. were searched in the open as a result of those works. Several quarries of strange shapes were dug and the Rio Tinto absorbed toxic acids and metals. Already the Carthaginians began the extraction of metals on the banks of the Rio Tinto, which caused water pollution. Thank you, and if you have enjoyed this video, please share it, like it, uh, subscribe to my channel, and stay tuned for other videos. There will be more. Also check out my other content. I do publish books, etc.